Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Marley, the director of the Lunar and Planetary Lab, and we're thrilled to have you here online and in person for the uh, our second public lecture of, uh, of the fall semester. We, uh, we paused our public lecture series uh, during COVID, and it's really great to uh, have it back again and have such a great uh, a great turnout. For those of you who are students who are perhaps here for extra credit for classes, the folks out at the table will be able to stamp your notes um, after the lecture on your way out. So just stop at the desk and then they can stamp the your paper for that. So tonight, um, you know, if you are here for our first public lecture uh, last month, you heard from uh, Professor Laurie Vascucci about how planets are formed. And tonight, kind of continuing the thread, we're going to talk about how we might find and study planets that uh, might be habitable in the search for life. And the person that's going to be telling us about that is Professor uh, Todd Robinson. Uh, Professor Robinson just joined us this, uh, this past uh, uh, August, coming from uh, uh, Northern Arizona University, where he was faculty in the astronomy department up there. But uh, <clears throat> uh, Ty got his start right here as an undergraduate at the University of Arizona. Originally, he was a uh, engineering major and then took some courses in physics and astronomy and got really excited uh, about the whole, under, you know, the whole uh, ability that what we do here in the College of Science is trying to understand understand the universe. And so he changed his major and ultimately went on to get a <clears throat> degrees, undergraduate degrees in physics and mathematics from the U of A. And then he moved to the University of Washington where he got his PhD. And he then became a postdoc at NASA's Ames Research Center where I used to be. And he was in fact my postdoc uh, in the late uh, 2000s. And so we're really pleased that we could uh, uh, Track Dr. Robinson back to uh, where he got his start here at the University of Arizona. So uh, with that, I will uh, leave it to him to tell us about finding other Earths with next generation telescopes. And if you have questions online, um, if you hold them to the end, we'll uh, be happy to take questions both from the audience here and online. Go ahead. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Mark. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ty Robinson. I am an associate professor here in the Lunar Planetary Laboratory. Um, so pleased to be with you here tonight talking about um, so, something that touches very close to my own research area. Um, astronomers and planetary scientists are on a quest right now, a quest that is, has been decades in the making and is nearing its zenith in a very exciting way. And so what that quest is towards is finding other worlds like our Earth around other suns. Now, if we went back, if we went back, there we go. Uh, if we went back just a couple of decades, astronomers and planetary scientists were quite confident in their ability to tell you what planetary systems should look like. And we thought, well, <clears throat> Given the simple rules that we thought governed how our planetary system assembled, that we should be able to use those rules, apply them to other planetary systems, and that other planetary systems should look, look like our own. Now, the structure of our planetary system um, looks pretty nice and neat in that you have the small rocky planets um, innermost in the system on orbits closest to the sun. And then we have the large gaseous planets orbiting far from our sun. Of course, orbital distances here are not to scale, just the relative sizes of these things. If orbital distances were to scale, I think Jupiter would look even more amazing in our night sky than it currently does. Um, and so we thought that other planetary systems should also have the rocky planets in the inner parts of the system and the gaseous worlds in the outer parts of the system. And we thought that there was a pretty straightforward explanation for why this would be the case. And the idea was that, well, stars form from cold, dense material in the interstellar medium, the medium between the stars. And so this is actually a, a, one of my favorite images from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope pointed in uh, towards the Orion Nebula. Um, and so these structures that you see right here are called propylids. 
And so these are um, gaseous, dusty, and icy structures that are collapsing in on themselves and are beginning the process of forming a star. If we were to rewind the clock in our own planetary system five billion years, you would have found that the sun itself was forming in an environment like this from a collapsing cloud of dust, gas, and ice. And so inside of that cloud, <clears throat> you would have had uh, collapsing motions going on, because of conservation of the spin in that cloud, eventually you would have had a young star forming at the center of that collapsing blob and then uh, material uh, and an orbit around uh, that uh, forming star. Um, then in that material that was in orbit around that forming star, you could have dust colliding with dust to form pebbles, pebbles colliding with pebbles to form rocks, rocks colliding with rocks to form boulders, all the way up to planets, rocky planets um, in the disk around this young star. <clears throat> and so that explains largely the formation of rocky planets. To get at the formation of gaseous giants like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in our system, you need to introduce a little bit more complexity. And you have to think about temperatures inside of that disk of material that is forming around that young star. And so in the disk of material around the, uh, the forming star, close in, you would have had high temperatures. High temperatures meant that really the only rocky material that was around were really rocks themselves. But as you go further and further away from that forming star, temperatures get cooler and cooler and cooler. And eventually you reach points in the disk where things like water ice can um, form, where things like CO2 ice can form in the disk. And that then means that you have additional materials to build planets out of. And so in the outer reaches of the planetary disk where it's cooler, you have additional building blocks of planets. And so what that means is that instead of just forming relatively small rocky worlds as you do in the inner parts of these disks, in the outer parts of these disks, you can grow even larger planets. And you can grow planets out of the combination of rock and ice that are big enough to then start to attract gas from this disk. And so the, by, by mass, most of this disk is made up of, out of hydrogen and helium gas. And so if you can start to attract gas, then you can really gobble up a huge amount of mass. And that's how you can grow something like Jupiter in our system, which is several hundred times more massive than our own Earth. And so here is a nice artist rendition of that process going on inside of a protoplanetary disk. And so you have some giant planets that maybe have already formed and then uh, a giant planet there in the process of forming that is uh, accumulating gaseous material from the protoplanetary disk. And now kind of touching on uh, Professor Pascucci's less, uh, lecture from about a month ago, um, something that I think is absolutely amazing is now using radio telescopes, we are uh, beginning to be able to image this process going on uh, and disks around young stars um, in, our, in our galaxy. And so this is one such image um, where you can see right here in the middle is the forming star. And then in the material, the, the uh, material around the star, you can see gaps have formed in the disk. And that is a telltale signature of a giant planet um, having formed and um, accumulated all of the gaseous material in its vicinity leading um, to something like Jupiter or Saturn. Um, <clears throat> and so, that then paints the picture behind, or at least what we thought painted the picture behind, how planetary systems should look. That you form the rocky things and close to the star, but you only have rocky material because it was warm in the protoplanetary disk. And then in the further reaches of planetary systems where it's cold and you have ices, you can then form the giants. Um, and then came the announcement of the first exoplanet discovered around a star other than our sun. And so I'm going to use the term exoplanet or extrasolar planets to talk about worlds around other stars. The first exoplanet discovered around a sun-like star gets the kind of barcode name 51 Pegasi B, not the most inspiring name, um, but it immediately presented a huge challenge to um, astronomers and planetary scientists in that this world was the size and mass of Jupiter in our system. Um, but tucked in extremely close to its host star, 10 times closer to its host star than even Mercury is uh, in our planetary system. And that immediately defied all of the rules that we thought we understood for how planets should form around stars. To put it in perspective, 
Here's a nice schematic of the inner regions of our planetary system with the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars depicted. And to just show you where if 51 Pegasi B were to be plopped down in our planetary system where it would orbit, maybe, there we go. That is where the orbit of 51 Pegasi B would be relative to the other to the planets of the inner part of our um, solar system. And so what this immediately told us was we had to throw at least parts of our ideas for planet formation out the window. And we now understand that our original idea for how planets form can still hold, but what we need to now incorporate is that planets can move both while they're forming and after they have formed in a process called planetary migration. Battery is unfortunately dying. Um, clicker. So since the discovery of 51 Pegasi B, which was announced in 1995, um, the field of exoplanet science has absolutely exploded. Um, it has gotten to the point, or it got to the point where NASA recognized the need for a dedicated mission to discover exoplanets around other stars, um, and actually more than one mission now these days. And so the, the first dedicated mission that did this was NASA's Kepler mission. We'll talk a little bit more about Kepler a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, but I wanted to just show you the haul of exoplanets that we got from Kepler. Um, it's really difficult to show all of the planets that Kepler detected. And this is a movie depicting just a subset of the worlds that Kepler detected. And so all of these little dots are on their kind of, uh, are on their kind of cosmic dance on their orbit around their host star. The size of the dot is meant to indicate something about how big that world is. The relative sizes of the orbits are meant to indicate how close or far they are from the star. Um, and then the colors there are meant to indicate something about how hot or cool those worlds are. And this is, again, just a subset of all of the different kinds of worlds that Kepler yielded for us. The planets, the exoplanets that have been discovered to date are distributed all over the night sky. And so this is a nice graphic showing um, where all of the known or many of the known exoplanets are. Um, and uh, odds are, if you go out at night, take a look at a star, the star you're looking at probably has at least one exoplanet orbiting around it. Whether or not we've detected it yet is another story, but the statistics tell us that um, on average, every star has at least one exoplanet orbiting around it. And so with such a large diversity of exoplanets, we've been able to answer a huge number of questions and learn a great number of things about worlds um, outside of our solar system. But I think that there is still one lingering question that people both inside and outside our field want to answer. And that is, are there other worlds like our Earth? And so I want to talk today, um, get into more detail about how I hope in our lifetimes uh, we're going to be able to answer this question. And in fact, on the time scale of about a decade, we're going to be building the technologies, the space telescopes that are going to be able to answer this question for us. And so now is a very exciting time in the search for other Earths. Now, to talk about how we find exoplanets means that I have to remove a bit of a bias that you might have in your brain about what exoplanets look like. Exoplanets might look like this. I don't know. This is an artist's rendition of what a potentially Earth-like exoplanet could look like. Um, but when astronomers study exoplanets, they don't look at all like this to us. We don't have wonderful spatial resolution uh, across the disk of the planet that we can then use to do characterization. To astronomers, exoplanets look like this. <laughs> um, and that isn't even fair. First of all, that's what seven exoplanets look like. <laughs> And furthermore, that's not even what those seven exoplanets look like. That's really just the star that they're orbiting around. Um, so this is the famous star uh, TRAPPIST-1. Um, this is an image of that star on the Kepler um, CCD. And so you can see individual pixels there are pixels on Kepler's CCD. And so the star itself is just a point of light to us. The stars are so distant that even with our best telescopes, they appear as a point of light. We don't have resolution on their disk. Um, and we certainly don't have resolution on the disks of the planets that might be orbiting those stars. And because stars are self-luminous and incredibly bright, that means that it is really difficult to spot the um, planets that may be orbiting around these stars. And so lost in the light 
um, of this um, star, TRAPPIST-1, um, is the, the signature is the light of um, at least seven planets that we know to be orbiting um, that, that star, including um, worlds that may be very much like our own, we just don't know yet. <laughs> so then how do astronomers go from something like this, where you can't actually see the planets to detecting exoplanets? So there are a couple of leading techniques right now, and then I'm gonna introduce a technique to you um, that is very much up and coming, and it's gonna be the way that we're going to potentially spot the exo-Earths. And so one of the leading techniques for um, detecting worlds around other stars relies on the Doppler technique. So you'll hear this referred to as the Doppler technique or the Doppel <laughs> technique or the radial velocity technique. And so the, the Doppler shift that we're talking about here is actually ultimately rooted in Einstein's relativity. And what it relies on is that when a light source is moving towards you, the light from that source is shifted ever so slightly to the blue. And when a light source is moving away from you, the light from that source is shifted ever so slightly to the red. You all have real world um, experiences with the Doppler technique, not with light probably, but uh, with sound. So you've all encountered an ambulance coming towards you and then away from you that sounds higher frequency when it's headed towards you and lower frequency when it's headed away. And so it's the exact same idea as the Doppler effect for sound, but applied to light. Now, <clears throat> combine the fact that when something's moving towards you, it's a little bit bluer and away from you, it's a little bit redder with the fact that stars wobble in response to planets orbiting around them. And so you may not have thought about this. You may think about orbits as just planets going around stars, but Newton told us that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And so just as the star is tugging on that planet, causing it to orbit, the planet is also tugging on the star and the star responds. The star's response isn't as much because the star is much more massive than the planet, but it does mean that the star does its own little dance, does its own little wobble in response to the gravitational tugs of the planet. So combined together, you should be able to detect the presence of planets around stars, um, or detect the presence of planets around stars by looking at the star and seeing if they're periodically wobbling and using your telescope to monitor the color of light coming from that star to see if it shifts bluewards, redwards, bluewards, redwards periodically to tell you that there's something orbiting around that star. It's not just stars out there in the cosmos that do this. Our own sun does this. And so this is a nice schematic of the wobble of our sun in response to the combined tugs of all of the planets in our system. And the bully in our system is Jupiter because it's so massive. Um, and so really the response that you're seeing there is the sun responding to the gravitational tugs of Jupiter, um, but really it responds to the tugs of the combined tugs of all the planets in our system. And so this graphic um, starts, uh, let's see, in at 1945, and then you can trace it around um, with the years added, which is the, 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 stun, the sun's wobble in response to gravitational tugs in our system. Now, <clears throat> something that I find absolutely amazing is how sensitive this technique is. And so modern instruments that aim to measure the Doppler wobble can tell you whether or not a star is moving towards or away from you at the sub-meter per second level. So at like the level of a few tens of centimeters per second. And so that means that we can take our telescope, we could point it at a star that is a million billion miles away. It is, imper it is imperceivably um, and unbelievably far away. And maybe this helps a little bit. If you were to shrink our sun down to the size of a beach ball about yay, the nearest star to our sun would be sitting on the other side of our planet, be somewhere in South Africa. Um, is about the, 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 to help put it in perspective how vast the distance is between stars. So a star that is a million billion miles away from us, we can point a telescope at it, and that telescope can tell you whether or not that star is doing this or whether or not that star is doing that, which is absolutely mind-blowing to me. <clears throat> and a real testament to um, the precision engineering that has gone on uh, to, to design these instruments. So that is the wobble technique. I wanna talk about now another technique that these days is the leading technique for detecting planets around um, other stars. And so this technique is really well illustrated by this image um, from our solar system from the year 2004. And this is the transit, the crossing of Venus across the disk of our sun that occurred in 2004, it occurred in the early 2010s. I hope you caught it then, I didn't. I was clouded out in Seattle, as you are. 
um, because it's not happening again until the 2100s. And so these were your these were your opportunities to see it. There are movies online, so if you want to go watch it online, there are some amazing videos that, that came from this. Now, um, what I want you to think about is if you were monitoring the brightness of our sun from Earth during this event, you could imagine that because Venus, when it's transiting the disk of, of our sun, blocks out a patch of the sun's disk, that the sun gets ever so slightly dimmer from our perspective as a consequence of that transit event. And so we can use that exact same idea to detect worlds going around other stars if they happen to transit across, move across the disk of that distant star. Now remember though, we don't resolve the disk of the star. We don't actually see the disk of the star as we do see the disk of, of our sun. It's just a point of light. And so the only thing you can do is monitor its total brightness and see if it dims and see if that dimming happens again and again and again periodically that tells you that there is a world on an orbit around that star. And so this is exactly what astronomers who use the transit technique do. So here's a cartoon of a planet crossing across the disk of a distant star. We don't actually see that with our telescope. With our telescope, all we can do is monitor how bright that star is and then look for dips, characteristic dips in its brightness that are called transits. And uh, again, if they happen with regularity, with periodicity, that says that there's something going around that star causing those dips and that's something um, can often be a planet. Now, this technique um, has been so critical that it warranted its own standalone mission. And so I mentioned the Kepler mission before. NASA's Kepler mission um, stared at a patch of the night sky in the constellation Cygnus. It stared at about 100,000 stars in that patch of the night sky and just looked and looked and looked and looked and looked for years and years and years, building up data upon data upon data, hoping to spot these little transits. Um, and the yield from Kepler has been amazing. Thousands of planets were detected in that way. The goal of Kepler was to be able to spot small planets though, Earth-sized things going around sun-sized stars. And to be able to do that, you needed a very precise um, telescope and very precise instruments. It's probably one of the most precise instruments that uh, humankind has, has engineered. Um, so you needed to be able to tell whether or not the brightness of those stars were changing at the level of one thousandth of one percent or better. So tiny changes in the brightness of that star is what you needed to be sensitive to to detect those Earths. Now, <clears throat> it's kind of difficult to picture what one thousandth of one percent or better um, looks like. And so I want to paint another picture here for you. This is when I was a kid, what I would have called the Sears Tower in Chicago. Apparently these days they call it the Willis Tower. Um, and so the Sears Tower has, sorry, the Willis Tower has 16,000 windows on it from this particular vantage. You're kind of staring at one corner of the Willis Tower there. There are about uh, 8,000 windows probably that you can see from this perspective. And about half of those windows uh, have lights on behind them. So about half of those windows are illuminated right now. So about 4,000 windows. Kepler, the Kepler telescope was so sensitive that if you were pointing it at the Willis Tower and monitoring the brightness of the Willis Tower, Kepler would have been able to know if you walked up to one of those windows and just lowered the blinds by about three inches, it would have detected the dip in brightness of the tower from just lowering the blinds a few inches. And so that was what was needed to be able to detect Earths uh, around uh, other suns. Again, an amazing engineering feat. <clears throat> So this is the hall of exoplanets. I want to say to date, but it's so hard to keep up with the hall of exoplanets that this was actually 2020. This was a wonderful graphic that was made um, probably to celebrate the threshold of crossing, or the crossing of the threshold of 4,000 known exoplanets detected. Um, and so this is the total number of known exoplanets, sorry, on here um, in, in different years. And so you can see that it's always growing in time because you're always adding more and more and more known exoplanets. And then the color coding here is what's important. So the red portions of these curves is, are the planets that we've detected with the, with the wobble technique. It was kind of the first one out of the gate, um, and it's been um, proceeding at a steady clip uh, ever since. The transit technique is what's in green here. It showed up a little bit later, but thanks to having space missions like Kepler and the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is an ongoing mission right now, um, that has um, dramatically increased the, the number of, of known exoplanets. Now, if you're staring at this, what you probably notice 
is there are some other colors sitting up there. Those are other ways that we detect exoplanets um, around um, stars. And so the, the blue, whoever made this graphic, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between purple and blue, but the blue coloration up there um, is an up and coming detection technique known as direct imaging or high contrast imaging. And this is completely different from um, the two techniques that I just described to you. Uh, and um, in this case actually has really nice graphics to go with it. So <clears throat> when you want to detect an exoplanet directly, you want to separate out the light from the very bright host star um, uh, from the light from the planets that are orbiting around it. This is very challenging to do because planets are exceptionally faint compared to the brightness of a star. They're not doing fusion after all, stars are doing fusion. Um, but now in a handful of cases using sophisticated um, optical instruments and sophisticated computer analysis, we have been able to do this. And so this is a famous now exoplanet system has a barcode name HR8799. There are four known exoplanets in this system. We've been monitoring this system over time now, long enough that you can see them on their Keplerian orbits uh, around the central star. And you say, well, where is the central star? Somebody put a little star dot right there. But really what's happened is, is using the analysis techniques, they've canceled out the light of that extremely bright star. So as you can now start to see the planets that are orbiting around it. Um, the technique um, these days, here's a, Example actually um, for the same system now done with Hubble. And so here's a raw image um, that we got from Hubble Space Telescope. This is what stars usually look like on space telescopes. Um, they're extremely bright. Um, they cause all kinds of optical uh, uh, issues on your CCD. They get these diffraction spikes. Um, and then through image processing techniques, um, the astronomers here were able to recover um, three of those exoplanets that we saw on the previous graphic. Um, this is a very challenging technique to employ because stars are so much brighter than the planets that orbit them. And so to be able to do this for every 10,000 photons of light that come in from that host star, um, you need to block all but one of them to be able to see those planets. So you need to block um, the, the brightness of the star at the level of 10,000 um, to, to spot the, in this case, relatively bright planets that are orbiting around the star. We've Employ this technique now for um, planets that are giant, which helps you when they're big, they send more photons your way. Uh, and we've also uh, and employed it for planets that are very hot, that have formed recently and are thousands of degrees in temperature. So because they're big and because they're hot, they are easier to spot than smaller, colder planets like our Earth, which is the thing that we're going to be going after. So um, NASA has now outlined um, a series of um, missions, both planned um, and recommended, that are going to extend this technique from giant hot exoplanets orbiting stars all the way down to being able to spot worlds like our own. And so um, the amaz amazing feat that is uh, James Webb Space Telescope, I'm sure you've all been seeing the imagery that has come from that, it's just mind blowing. Um, what uh, the, the success that James Webb has already been. Um, James Webb has on board instrumentation that is going to be canceling out light from stars at the level of about uh, 10,000. So from every 10,000 photons of light that come from that star, you block all but one of them to be able to spot faint planets going around. Um, launching on the time scale of uh, a few years is the uh, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Um, this is the primary mirror there is kind of a clone of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and so the mirror there is smaller than what Webb has. It's about a human sized mirror. Um, the, Nancy Grace Roman Space, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is going to do all kinds of great astrophysics, but it's also going to have some dedicated exoplanet science. And on the exoplanet side of things, it is going to have an instrument on board called a coronagraph. And the job of a coronagraph is to do this light canceling technology um, so that you can spot faint planets. The chronograph that's going to be on board the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is going to block light at the billion level. And so for every billion photons of light that come from the star, you need to block all but one of them to be able to spot even fainter planets orbiting some nearby stars. What's going to happen with Roman is called a technology demonstration. So we're proving that we're going to be able to operate this very precise instrument in space. And then 
uh, kind of riding on the tails of that technology demonstration, NASA um, has now been charged with building a next generation of space telescope that is going to be able to spot um, even smaller, even fainter worlds around nearby stars. And so the goal of this future mission is to be able to return data that are going to look like this. And so this is um, a scientific illustration of what that future mission would be able to do for our own planetary system. So imagine that you were staring at a system like our own with a space telescope that now is able to cancel light at the 10 billion level. And so for every 10 billion photons that come in from that host star, you block all but one of them. And that enables you to see things like small rocky exoplanets orbiting around nearby stars. Um, and so we're embarking on the science and engineering of this right now with the, the goal of starting to build this mission on the time scale of about a decade. And so I am extremely excited that on the time scale of a couple of decades, we're going to be spotting pale blue dots around our nearest stellar neighbors. Now, I have been talking about things like 10 billion, you know, 10 billion photons from the star cancel one of those, all but one of those, um, and you can spot the other. So I want to try to, to paint a picture here of how challenging this is for the, for the engineers that are working on this. And so now, uh, imagine I put you uh, in a boat and I told you to row 30 miles, just a small distance, told you to row 30 miles away from this lighthouse that I'm going to be hanging out in. And from a distance of 30 miles, um, I want you to be able to spot something faint. And so let's talk about what faint is. Uh, the lighthouse bulb there is extremely luminous. And so the kind of faint things that these future telescopes are going to be able to detect it's going to be even better than me holding up a 60 watt light bulb next to that um, lighthouse bulb. It's going to be even better than me holding up a single LED next to that um, uh, lighthouse light bulb. The challenge that is before us is from a distance of 30 miles, you need to be able to detect me holding a lightning bug next to that lighthouse. And I'm holding that lightning bug about three inches from the lighthouse bulb is about what you need to be able to do. And so people are working on this in the lab right now proving the technology, developing the technology, and it's gonna fly in a telescope. And I'm so excited about that. Okay, <clears throat> now, how are we gonna know the Earths from the non-Earths? In this scientific illustration that I have here, I have conveniently, or they have conveniently labeled the Venus and the Earth, which we know are very different planets. Um, but if I were to just blindly hand you this image, how would you know that one of these is a hellscape and the other one is a Clement planet with things like, I don't know, uh, uh, martinis on beaches and those kinds of things. Um, and so <clears throat> you have a couple of hints that you can go off of to try to figure out the Earth from the not Earth. And one of the hints that you have is a concept called the habitable zone, which many of you have probably heard of before, sometimes referred to as the Goldilocks zone. And so this is the range of orbital distances around a star where a planet like our Earth could hope to have liquid water oceans on the surface, could hope to be habitable to um, life. And so um, the, the kind of the physics behind this is, is that as the world gets too close to the host star, it's receiving too much radiation, it gets hot, becomes uninhabitable. If you drag the planet too far away from the host star, the world is not receiving enough insulation, enough starlight to stay warm, it freezes over. And so on the one hand, you've got Venus as the, as the too hot and Mars as the too cold and Earth as the just right. Um, around stars of different sizes, Larger stars than the sun are more luminous. Smaller stars than our sun are less luminous. And so the, the Goldilocks zone is just closer to the fainter stars and further away from the brighter stars. And so this is your first guidepost to whether or not an, a world that you have dis, just discovered with direct imaging has any hope of potentially being like our Earth. But the problem is, is that worlds that are just at the cusp of either side of the habitable zone, so Earth is... Um, pretty near the inner edge of the habitable zone for our sun. Venus is just inside the inner edge of the habitable zone for our sun. Um, and so a small, um, a small difference in orbital distance is a huge change in what these planets are like. And in fact, it would be very challenging for one of these future space telescopes to determine the orbit of its targets to a high enough precision to know confidently that this thing is more like Earth or more like a Venus. And so, the next hint that you need to go after is to start to learn something about their atmospheres, because that's really what is distinguishing Venus in our system 
from Earth in our system. Venus is a very thick atmosphere, about 100 times thicker than our own, composed primarily of carbon dioxide, which is the yellow color here, with a little bit of nitrogen, whereas our own Earth um, is a relatively thin atmosphere by planetary standards, um, composed primarily of, of nitrogen, N2, with a heavy sprinkling of molecular oxygen, O2, which comes from oxygenic photosynthesis on our planet, and is thus a very strong indicator of life. So, how are we going to determine the composition of the atmospheres of these worlds that we detect with this future um, telescope? What we're gonna do is we're gonna do atmospheric spectroscopy. And so the idea behind this science is, well, light from the star leaves the star, it's light of all colors, it's white light, it reflects off of the planet, it travels the vast distances of space to our telescope, and our telescope has some way of splitting the light up into its constituent colors, and then what you get is a spectrum uh, of that planet. And so how bright that planet is at different colors. And when I say colors, I mean the colors you and I see with our eyes. These future missions are gonna operate at visible wavelengths, and they're also gonna operate at wavelengths that we can't see with our eyes. But all of those wavelengths are useful for doing atmospheric, um, uh, for understanding atmospheric composition. Now, how does this work? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. The molecules that make up um, planetary atmospheres, um, each distinct molecule vibrates and rotates at its own characteristic frequencies. And by frequencies for light, that also means colors. And so molecules vibrate and rotate at specific colors and interact with light through those vibrations and rotations. And so that means that every molecule, every distinct molecule has its own characteristic spectrum of vibrations and rotations. And so in the same way that um, sound occurs at characteristic frequencies, we can link sound to the spectrum of different molecules. And so um, I don't think you knew that you were going to get uh, a performance here tonight. And I assure you, I am no xylophone virtuoso, but we're gonna talk about atmospheric spectroscopy with a little xylophone here. And so what that means is that water can have its own characteristic sound. Carbon dioxide, its own. Nitrogen, its own. And lastly, oxygen. Get all those? So what that then means is that with our future space telescope, we could look at the spectrum of a world. Um, and maybe this is just a typical rocky world. And so from the colors that we get from that planet, we would be able to know that this is a pretty boring, typical, rocky exoplanet. That's the sound of my, my typical rocky exoplanet. I'm going to be ecstatic to get observations of just typical rocky exoplanets with this future mission. But what I really hope for is maybe there are some worlds out there that sound a little bit unique. A little bit of oxygen introduced there. And so we think that at least for Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, oxygen does not come from um, sources that aren't life. I'm fairly confident that oxygen is um, an important indicator of life on a planet. And so uh, one of the key goals of this future mission is to be able to detect oxygen in the atmospheres of these extremely faint uh, worlds orbiting distant stars. Um, so that not only do we know are there other worlds like Earth out there that maybe have oceans, but maybe there are other worlds like Earth out there that have life. And to just prove to you that my day-to-day -day existence isn't playing the xylophone, um, this is a little bit of data for actually, in this case, most importantly, uh, Venus and the gray and Earth here. And so this is brightness on this axis, or more bright up here and less bright down here. And this is color along this axis. And so these, this little um, rainbow that I have on here are the colors that you see with your eyes. And so um, you can see that Venus is kind of peaking in the yellowy colors, which explains why Venus looks yellowy to us. Earth is peaking over here in the blue wavelengths, which is why Earth appears blue to us. Um, but you can see labeled on here, regions of these spectra where light appears to be missing. Those are called absorption bands. Those are the vibrations and the rotations of molecules interacting with light from our sun. And so here are the characteristic tones and overtones of carbon dioxide 
for earth, the characteristic tones and overtones of water, and then there and there are the characteristic tones and overtones of, of uh, molecular oxygen, signs of life. And so through atmospheric spectroscopy, we are gonna be able to go from the hundreds of worlds that this future mission is going to detect and characterize down to the ones that are like our Earth. You see it? <laughs> and with that, I will say thank you and take any questions. You can see why we were so pleased to uh, capture Dr. Robinson from NAU uh, to come here and join us. Any questions in the, in the hall for, uh, for today? Who is Nancy Grace Roman? Uh, <clears throat> I meant to actually study this before I came in. Nancy Grace Roman is a, a pioneer astrophysicist. It's about the best response that I have for you right now. <clears throat> So the, yeah, the, uh, you know, I was on one of the committees that helped uh, kind of design that telescope. And it's a, like Hubble, it's kind of a leftover spy telescope that uh, is going to be purpose for this. Uh, any other questions uh, in the hall? It used to be called W First. And so for the longest time, we knew it as W First. And it has a, a new name, which is great. And some of us have been slow to, uh, to uptick to, to Roman or Nancy Grace Roman. Uh, how about online? Oh, we have a question in the red shirt. Yeah, yes, there is an online question. Um, Matthew asks uh, if the transit, does the transit measurement require telescopes to point at the star for centuries to capture a transit? If the planet that you were hoping to detect had an orbit that took centuries to go through, then its transit event would occur once every century. And so indeed there are, you expect planets to be on very wide orbits that take centuries to, to go around the star. Um, and so transits could take centuries to detect them. The missions that we have launched to date have studied stars for time scales measured in years. And that's primarily motivated by wanting to detect things like Earth's whose orbit is one year. And you wanna spot a handful, a few transits of that world to be sure that it's actually periodic. And so you need at least a few years of data to spot the Earth's orbiting the suns. Go ahead here. Oh. Um, so I have a question concerning like the idea that gaseous planets attract, you know, like for example, in our solar system, like um, hydrogen um, in this like kind of search for exoplanets, have um, we discovered any sort of um, planets, gaseous planets that have attracted different types of gas? And if so, is that maybe an explanation why these um, planets have been able to migrate closer to their respective stars that like, like kind of the gas is moving away? So we have detected um, a wide array of planets that we think have a huge diversity of atmospheric types. And so we've detected the extreme, the worlds that have predominantly hydrogen atmospheres like Jupiter in our solar system. We've detected planets that are tucked in very close to their host star that are small and so heavily irradiated that we don't think they even have an atmosphere anymore. They're just a barren rock. Then the atmosphere has been baked off of them and everything in between, including worlds that have likely have predominantly water uh, atmospheres. And so that sounds and are more common in size to say Uranus and Neptune in our system than to, to Jupiter. Um, and so that starts to sound like an intermediate case between the rocky worlds and the completely gaseous worlds. And so we kind of have now a full um, spectrum of different kinds of planets that we have, we have detected. Um, and so uh, the, the, short, the answer to the other part of your question about, you know, does this have anything to do with migration? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, and so there are um, myriad uh, interactions between the mass of the planet what its um, atmosphere is composed of um, and what its atmosphere is composed of that both determine um, its migration and then what it does after it migrates. So some planets can migrate and then lose their atmosphere after they move in close to their host star, which then makes them look like different worlds now than what they looked like when they started that process. Um, and to throw in an even uh, more complicating factor to the question, the migration of planets and planetary systems um, doesn't just depend on the, the solar planet, the planet alone. It depends on what its neighboring planets are doing too. 
Um, and so the neighboring planets can also be moving and that can impact how an interior planet or an exterior planet uh, is moving on migration. Um, and so that complexity then helps to explain why when we look at exoplanetary systems, we don't see um, just a whole bunch of systems that look like our own. We see a huge diversity of exoplanetary systems with regards to what planets of different sizes are on what different orbits. And that's because the process of planet migration um, is so dependent on the many different things that are going on in the planetary system that the outcomes are so diverse. Thank you. First, I want to thank you for this great presentation. I have understood all the techniques to, techniques to detect planets, the exoplanets, but I have a small confusion. How, uh, if you cannot see the planets or the stars, uh, how do we know that the telescope is pointed at the right direction and that we get the data from, and we get the data, uh, the ones that we think it is? Yep. Um, <clears throat> and so there is, there is a detail of, of telescopes that engineers worry a lot about, which is referred to as pointing, and that's exactly what you just described. Where is the, where is the telescope looking, and is it looking at the right target? Um, and so this is, um, fortunately, um, because we have, are building upon um, decades and decades and decades of precision pointing of telescopes on the ground and in space, um, this is something that um, future telescopes are going to be pretty confident in. Um, and so, especially for direct imaging, um, you need to first locate the star that you want to then look for planets around. And then you want to block out the light from that star to be able to see the faint things around it. And so um, you benefit there from initially when you point your telescope at the star, you get to see the star. And then you start the process of blocking out its light progressively more and more and more and more until the faint planets that are orbiting around it start to shine uh, relative to that dark spot that you're digging a hole of uh, for the for that um, central star. Thank you. Yep. But it, I mean, I was involved with the uh, JWST observation where the, they did the, the people that set it all up made a slight mistake and the star wasn't quite where they thought it was and they didn't get it. So the, finding the right spot to point out is, is always one of the things in the details that takes a lot of effort. Yeah. Uh, if a very small amount of oxygen is detected in the planet's in a planet's atmosphere, how would you distinguish between some photosynthetic process and photo dissociation of water vapor from UV radiation? In the latter case, you might even see a correlation between that and if it's a red dwarf star, parent star flaring, which tend to do when they're young, yep. they emit flares. So that's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about that? Um, so uh, there is a, a growing literature on ways in which planets can have oxygen in their atmosphere that doesn't come from life. Um, and fortunately, um, the, the majority of those uh, scenarios involve having a, a small red dwarf host. Um, and so something that I benefit from in this presentation is that these future direct imaging missions are gonna go, are gonna look for Earths around sun-like stars. And so you don't have the flaring complications and the red dwarf star complications. Um, still, I suspect that um, future astronomers, future planetary scientists, myself included, um, when they detect um, oxygen in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, they're not just gonna stop at that um, because they're, um, I feel like, well, they're not going to stop at that because uh, there are alternative ways to potentially create that oxygen and you want to know if those alternative ways are going on in that world. And so um, there, uh, for everyone who's been working on these mission concepts, the, the thrust has really been in understanding the planetary environment as best as you can. You want to know all you can about the host star. What's the spectrum of the host star? You want to know the orbit of the planet. You want to know what other gases are present in the atmosphere of the planet. You want to know how thick the atmosphere is so that you can do your best to understand all of the context of what's going on in that planetary environment, and then hopefully distinguish between whether or not maybe it's photo dissociation leading to oxygen buildup or um, life leading to oxygen buildup. And so there are ways of distinguishing between these. You, you, you noted that you're gonna be destroying water um, in the process of creating this oxygen. So then that means that you really wanna get a handle on how much water is in the atmosphere of this of this world? Is it a steam atmosphere that's gonna run away like Venus did at some point uh, in, its, in its history? Um, or is it an Earth-like amount of water in the atmosphere? 
which then um, you would suspect isn't driving enough photo dissociation to get tens of percent of water, or sorry, tens of percent of oxygen in, in that atmosphere. And so context is, is gonna be um, incredibly important here. Uh, we've got lots of questions. Um, um, I was wondering, is it always planets that we look at for finding other Earths? Or do you think that like a moon, because I, I know that Jupiter's moon has rivers on it. Yes. Um, and so I like to distinguish between the hunt for life in exoplanet systems and the hunt for life in our own planetary system. And so as you just noted, there are um, many incredibly interesting and very promising targets for habitable environments in our own planetary system. One of those, um, which I think you're hinting at here, was is the moon Europa around Jupiter, which um, most likely has oceans larger in volume than the oceans on our Earth. Um, so that sounds like a potentially great environment to go hunt for life. But the processes and the techniques that you use to hunt for life in the solar system um, are very different because you can um, land spacecraft, you can orbit spacecraft, you can bring back samples. And that's different from what you can do for exoplanets. For exoplanets, we're always limited to just the light that we can observe from them that has traversed um, the cosmos and, and made its way to, to our telescope. Um, but I don't want to write off the, uh, the chance that there could be uh, large moons orbiting around giant exoplanets uh, in the habitable zones of their star. And so imagine if we had a Jupiter in our planetary system, imagine if we had a Jupiter um, in the habitable zone of the sun, and then orbiting around that Jupiter was an Earth-sized moon, and that moon could potentially be quite habitable. Um, that idea is not ruled out, but the challenge of spotting very faint planets next to very bright stars and becomes even more complicated if you want to spot faint planets orbiting brighter planets orbiting very bright stars. And so it's kind of going to be outside the reach of what these future telescopes are going to be able to do, um, just because the, the, the challenge of, of spotting those moons is great. Let's, let's check online. Uh, any more questions online? There aren't any right now. Okay, uh, back to the room. Yeah. Um, if you look at the wobble tank, and I think uh, a lot of complications I don't know how you could account for, which is like um, the rotation of the Earth and the Sun and the, the rotation or the wobble in the Earth, which you could include the Chandler periods. And you also have the wobble in the Earth related to the Moon. Uh, you might even probably in the same order of magnitude, the wobble because of Jupiter. And then you have different amounts of wobble if you're at different angles in the sky because of the rotation of the Earth. How do you account for all of those? Uh, carefully. <laughs> um, so uh, many of the processes that you just described either operate at different um, uh, speed scales or different time scales than the, than the signature that you're going after. And so you can, um, you can uh, account for them um, say differently. Um, but there are a number of physical processes that um, modern day astronomers who are trying to push the limits of this technique um, are running into. And so the kinds of uh, processes that they're running into that are operating at centimeters per, per, per second are um, thermal control of the instrument. If your instrument gets a little bit warmer and a little bit cooler and a little bit warmer and a little bit cooler, now you could be inducing uh, signatures into your data. Um, Earth's atmosphere has motions that are occurring at the centimeters per second, meters per second, and um, uh, kind of range. And so you have to account for that, which is a big challenge. The star that you are pointing at has convective cells on it that are going up and down as convection does at the tens of centimeters per second uh, level sometimes. Um, and so uh, these challenges have not been fully sorted out yet. Um, and they turned out to be key because if you want to spot Earths around suns, you need to be able to get down to about 10 centimeters per second precision. Um, and we have instruments that are, that are delivering that, but the noise and the data can be, can be large because of those processes that I just described that make it very hard to spot those Earths. Um, and so we're kind of in this phase where the astronomers who do that kind of work are, are they're pioneers and they're trying to figure out, well, how do we count for this? How do we count for that? What are the things that we can do to take better data and get down to the 10 centimeter per second level? Um, and the answer isn't apparent yet, um, but they are, they are certainly working on it. 
One of the answers is to go to space and do this. Because once you're in space, you no longer have the Earth's atmosphere, which is in introducing some of this noise. And so like one solution would be, would be do it from orbit. Any other questions? Is there anything you could observe that would lead you to think that not only is there life, but there is some advanced type of civilization with some type of pollution or something that would indicate an advanced society? Um, yes, and I think there are, there are many things. Um, what this, uh, and, and so the, those are all lumped into a broad category of signatures called techno signatures. So they're, they're the signs of some kind of technological civilization. Um, and the, the techno signatures that you might go after uh, depend on what instruments you're using. And so for these um, future uh, space telescopes, um, we haven't thought too much about what um, kinds of pollutants might show up in an atmosphere that's indicative of a civilization on it. Um, we know from our experience on this earth, the chlorofluorocarbons that um, uh, came from coolants and then led to the partial destruction of the ozone layer, those actually show up in Earth's spectrum um, at infrared wavelengths. So those are much redder colors than what these telescopes can be operating at. Um, and so you can look for those kinds of things uh, in, in exoplanet atmospheres. Um, technological civilizations may be emitting their own radiation at radio wavelengths as our civilization does. And so a telescope operating at those very long wavelengths might be able to detect radio emissions from, from planets. Um, and so there's certainly a lot of thought that has gone into this. Um, the, the wavelengths that we're using for exoplanet characterization with these future missions that are gonna detect exoverse are kind of visible wavelengths. Um, and so there it's like, maybe a civilization has covered the surface of its planet with something that has such a unique color that you can't describe it with um, physical processes. Uh, and um, there have been some ideas uh, where natural processes that aren't life don't tend to produce things that are vertical, but our civilization makes buildings that are quite vertical. Um, nature has produced trees that are quite vertical, um, and those cast shadows in very different ways than gently undulating things like mountains that geology tends to produce. And so maybe there's some hope with probably not these telescopes, but future telescopes that you might be able to distinguish a planetary surface that has shadows on it from vertical things versus things that has shadows on it from smooth undulating things. So people are being clever about this. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. Um, so I have a question con um, concerning these like blue um, hyper giant stars. Um, I've heard that we've discovered a couple of them. And I was wondering how would um, like life survive, uh, life exist in any of them? Um, solar systems with a blue hyper giant star in the center and if they you know if there's some possible way that planets could survive like the luminosity and their uh, radiation would it be related to their distance away from the star yep so in theory you could have a gigantic massive star um that uh well you you can't have okay the the question is about massive stars that are um so huge um that they are quite blue and they're quite luminous um, in theory, you can have a habitable zone around those stars, um, but you run into a problem where the lifetimes of those stars are um, so incredibly short that the most massive stars live fast, die young, um, and uh, explode in timescales of millions of years to tens of millions of years, um, which is about the same time scale that um, uh, planets are forming. And so you run into a problem where the, the most massive stars go supernova before you could hope to form planets around them. Um, but in theory, if you could form planets fast enough, there would be a range of little distances around those stars um, where you, you could have liquid water oceans. The UV environment might be intense because these stars are so luminous and so blue. Um, but if you bury yourself under enough water, you've got yourself a sufficient UV radiation shield um, that, that life could be, could be happy. All right, let me check one last time for online, uh, Amy. Uh, no other questions right now. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks very much for, the, uh, for, for coming tonight. If you have any questions afterwards, I'm sure Dr. Robbins would be happy to, to take them in person. And again, if you're a student and you need something stamped, they can do that for you on the way out. And so let's thank our speaker again.
Uh, we have uh, one more uh, uh, talk in this series from Dr. Sukrit Ranjan, who's going to tell us more about uh, the uh, the chemistry, I think, of uh, of life and some of the, the things that can be happening on these planets more specifically. So hope you can come to that uh, next month. And again, thank you all for coming. Good night.